Amen. As I was getting ready for this moment, something struck me in the readings that didn't quite touch me during my preparations this week. You know, a shepherd's job is actually quite simple. He has two assignments, basically. Feed the sheep and protect the sheep. And Jesus, the good shepherd, does two things in our gospel text today that relate to that. He prepares and he pursues. But before I go into that, there's a story about a hymn writer. Now this may seem amazing to you that a hymn writer could lose the joy of salvation, but it happens. Robert Robinson, the author of the hymn, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. You all know that song. He lost the happy communion with the Savior he had once enjoyed. And in his declining year, he wandered into the byways of sin. And as a result, he became deeply troubled in spirit. Hoping to relieve his mind, he decided to travel. In the course of his journey, he became acquainted with a young woman on spiritual matters. And so she asked him what he thought of a hymn she had just been reading. To his astonishment, he found it to be none other than his own composition. He tried to evade her question, but she continued to press him for a response. And suddenly he began to weep. With tears streaming down his cheeks, he said, I am the man who wrote that hymn many years ago. I'd give anything to experience again the joy I knew then. Although greatly surprised, she reassured him that the streams of mercy mentioned in his song still flow. Mr. Robinson was deeply touched. Turning his wandering heart to the Lord, he was restored. To full fellowship. You know, we have those times and seasons that St. Lawrence called the dark night of the soul. Those moments when it seems God is far away, that the clouds are thick and the skies are dark. But even in those moments, the light of life can be restored as simply as by turning around. Bow your heads with me. Blessed Lord, you have caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning. Grant that we may so hear them, read, mark, learn, and take them to heart, that by the patience and comfort of your holy word, we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Last Sunday, we read from Psalm 1 with its comparison of the way of the righteous and the way of the wicked. In our gospel text today, we open with the assessment of Jesus by the Pharisees and scribes. According to them, Jesus is not the blessed man of Psalm 1, verse 1. He is one of those who are like the chaff that the wind drives away. And in their eyes, the sooner, the better. In their eyes, Psalm 1 is a warning that Jesus ignored, not only to his peril, but putting the entire nation at risk of a repetition of the Babylonian captivity as he leads the entire nation astray. Well, we know by faith that they were wrong, that they failed to grasp the true purpose of God's law and the coming of the Messiah. It had been two years since Jesus launched his mission with his announcement in the synagogue in Nazareth. During that time, he had taught and preached about the kingdom of God. He had cast out demons. He had performed miracles. 
But rather than repent and believe the gospel, even when they were encouraged to do so by John the Baptist, they dug in their heels, not learning from the king in the illustration in last week's gospel text. They decided that they could defend their position against this king who comes against them. But Jesus does not give up on the scribes and Pharisees. His teachings and parables would either drive them or draw them. If they had ears to hear, they would hear. If not, the words that he spoke to them would condemn them at his return in glory. Let me begin at verse 3. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends together and says, come, rejoice with me. For I have found my lost sheep. I tell you, in the same way, there'll be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who do not need to repent. Last week, we heard about the high-level commitment that it takes to be Jesus' disciple. Some have preached last week's gospel text to say that if you weren't keeping it 100% for Jesus, you were done. You might as well not even bother to sign up if you weren't certain that you were going to be sold out for Jesus. In the words of a Helen Baylor song. And today, you can hear Jesus saying that far from weeding out the less than perfect, Jesus is trying to avoid losing even those who wander away. But wait, saints, there's more. Jesus continues. Or suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she does find it, she calls her friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me. I have found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. One silver coin in our days of cashless society, that seems like such a small thing. But that's because for most of us, when we think of a silver coin, at most we only think of one of those silver dollars. And after all, what can you buy with a silver dollar? But those 10 silver coins represented her dowry, her worth. And one of those coins was one-tenth of the entirety of her value. And so, yes, it was of great importance to her. And so, although one sheep out of a hundred, what's one sheep out of a hundred? But when you are tasked to protect and feed one hundred sheep, one sheep is one sheep too many. But this time, Jesus compares the sinner to a person who gets lost with no fault of their own. The woman says, remember, rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I lost. Do you find it amazing that God might take it personally when we wander away? That God might feel personally responsible for the state of your soul? So much so that not only does he go looking for you, not only does he send what some call the hound of heaven, the Holy Spirit, to convict you concerning sin, righteousness, and judgment. No, he did far more than that. He did more than giving you a law, which if a man does, he shall live thereby. God went so far to rescue you from the bondage of sin that he sent his only son, not just to teach you the right way, not just to model it, to be an example, but to actually die for your sake, to die so that you could live 
to die so that your sins would not be counted against you. And then send his word to heal you. The gospel, the preaching of it brings faith as it is written. Faith comes by hearing and hearing from the word of Christ. A simple word, Christ died for you according to the scriptures. He was buried and rose again according to the scriptures. That will transform you from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his beloved son. That will preserve you when the storm clouds rise. That those simple words will comfort you when it seems that all has turned against you. And there is, as the sinners would say, no help for you in God. Because those words tell you that the Lord is a present help for you. He died for you. And the God who knew no sin, who knew nothing about tasting death, tasted death for you, became sin for you. The shepherd who had 99 sheep that were perfectly safe went after you. The, the God who had an entire nation that he claimed as his own went after you. Those who were outside the covenant of grace. And by you, I also mean me because I'm not an Israelite. The blood of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob does not go through my veins so far as I know. I'm numbered among the Gentiles. I had no hope in God until God Sent his son. The Old Testament prophet Isaiah talked about it in Isaiah 53. He took our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. People wonder why, especially African American Christians, why do we look so much at the book of Exodus? Why do we take such stock in the first five books of the Bible? Why do we see Christianity not just in terms of an individual soul thing, but in how it impacts an entire family, an entire community? It's because we see ourselves there. We see our families there, our communities there. We see how sin puts people in bondage and not just individuals, but entire communities, entire nations go into bondage over sin. And we see how God cares not just for individuals, but he cares for their families, for their community, for their nation. And so we see ourselves there, there too, if you will. But God declares that these are his sheep and he will search for us. He searches for you. He cares for you, regardless of whether you care for you. God, in the person of Christ Jesus, cares for you. And this is not a part-time thing with this. It's not a side hustle, this mission of God. It informs everything that God does concerning us, even why he inspired holy men of God to write as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. As St. Peter wrote in his second epistle, in chapter one, we also have the, more, the prophetic message as something completely reliable, something made more sure, and you will do well to pay attention to it as to a light shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your heart. Not just objectively rises. Oh, he is risen. He is risen indeed. But when he rises in you, when it becomes real to you, when you recognize not only that Christ died, but that he died for you. And above all, Peter continues, understand that no prophecy of scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation. 
Prophecy never had its origin in the human will, but prophets, human beings, though they were, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. They didn't speak their own words of comfort. They didn't speak their own words of good fortune. They spoke what God told them to speak. They wrote down what God told them to write down. They collected what God told them to collect. And they put together what God told them to put together. And that's why we have the Holy Scripture. That's why it doesn't matter what part of the globe you're in. The Word of God says the same thing. Christ is for you. It doesn't say that he's for some of you, depending on what nation you grew up in, what color you are, how much money you have. It simply says, Christ died for you. God's word will be for all of us, the passion that God has for all of us. Therefore, the passion that God's children have for all of us. See, being a disciple, we learned last week, is a connection that outweighs all other connections, amen? It has temporal and eternal consequences, not just for you, but for everyone to whom you are connected by God. Every connection is an opportunity to show Christ's love for us, his zeal for those who are not yet restored to fellowship with him by grace through faith that comes through the preaching and hearing of the pure gospel. That's why we don't shrink from proclaiming the law in all its harshness to those who try to drown out the voice of the Lord when he speaks clearly about sin and righteousness. We don't speak God's law to put sinners down. We speak God's law to warn sinners of their peril. We don't hesitate to confront evil by exposing it to the light of God's word rather than exposing it to our personal opinions. And by praying for those who are ensnared by it, instead of standing on the sidelines pointing at them, even though they might despise us for what we do. When by the grace of God and the power of the Holy Spirit, this ministry bears fruit of repentance, we rejoice because we know that the devil loves regret, but hates repentance. The devil doesn't mind if you've got a mountain of regret. Just as long as you don't have an ounce of repentance. Hear the word of the Lord through the prophet Ezekiel. Son of man, say to the Israelites, this is what you are saying. Our offenses and sin weigh us down and we are wasting away because of them. How then can we live? Say to them, as surely as I live, declares the Lord God, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that they turn from their ways and live. Turn from your evil way. Why will you die, people of Israel? Hear also what the Lord says through James, the brother and servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. Or do you think the scripture says without reason that he jealously longs for the spirit he has caused to dwell in us? But he gives more grace. That is why the scripture says God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, sinners. Purify your hearts, double minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. The same Lord who took on death itself to give you life wants you to move beyond affection and embrace love. Move beyond passive acceptance of his gift and move to active service to others for his sake. As he enables us to be disciples by the power of the Holy Spirit, whom he gives to us in holy baptism, he calls us by that same spirit to embrace and live out his passion to seek those who are yet scattered yet covered and hidden by the darkness of sin, so that they might also walk in the sunshine of the glorious gospel of Christ, as it is written. This is the message that we have heard from him and declare to you, God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. 
If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, continuously cleanses us from all sin. And so God calls us to believe that Christ is for you and to join him on his mission. He tells us he won't leave us alone. He will supply all our needs and that we will have the help of our brothers and sisters. We can discover that he really does enable us to do exceedingly and abundantly above all we would ask or think according to his power at work in us. So let the peace of God that passes all understanding guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen and amen.